And I'd like to call to order the King George County School Board, the regular meeting for December 14th, 2020. Uh, the uh, ROTC will join us in leading the Pledge of Allegiance and then a moment of silence. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. May be seated. Thanks, guys. Okay, first on the agenda is the recognition VSBA honor roll program. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board in our community. We have several. Um, partners with whom we work each year and our schools are supported and are, and are very pleased to receive the support, the support from uh, local organizations. Each year we have an opportunity to recognize a few of those organizations uh, through the Virginia School Boards Association Honor Roll Program. So back in April, the school board cho uh, chose three businesses to be honored for this recognition. Um, we've, we've delayed recognition until a time we, we could bring these people uh, together to recognize them here at one of our public board meetings. So tonight, I um, want to recognize three businesses that have been nominated and received this recognition. First, um, I, I believe Mr. Uh, Tom Campbell of Campbell's Vending is attending our meeting virtually. Um, we appreciate all that Campbell's Vending has done to support our schools um, through vending, uh, nutritional vending in our schools. Uh, and we thank Mr. Campbell and his company for their support. And for that, Mr. Campbell, I don't know if you can see, but we have a um, certificate for you, suitable for framing. Um, and I'll read the certificate. The wording is the same on each of these, but I'll read the first one uh, for everybody. The King George County School Board expresses appreciation for your ongoing support of this community's public schools. Your work has aided this community in focusing on the goal of providing the best public schools we can for every child who attends. And this is signed by Ms. Patterson, the Executive Director of the Virginia School Boards Association. So thank you, Mr. Campbell, and to Campbell's Vending for your support, sir. Next, here with us in attendance is Pastor uh, Chip Blakely of New Life, or I'm sorry, Life Point Church. Um, Pastor Blakely, come on down if you would. We appreciate uh, the support that you provide our schools, uh, and not just our schools. I know that we, on occasion we have had events uh, that are beyond the school day where LifePoint has stepped up and helped, uh, has volunteered uh, their, their equipment, uh, their help to, to make sure that uh, other events besides the church go off um, well here at our school. So, uh, Pastor, we appreciate your support, and we're happy to host you um, and meet your church's needs, and we appreciate the partnership. Thank so you, thank you. <laughs> Next to be recognized is our King George Family YMCA. Um, I know Ms. Taylor, the Chief Operating Officer, I believe is joining us virtually. Uh, here in, in person is Ms. Megan Williams. Come on over, Megan. The YMCA does a, uh, a good many things to support our schools. Uh, to say the least, they, they host our swimming program. Um, they have most recently been an MVP in stepping forward and providing daily child care uh, help for our staff so that we can uh, fulfill the mission of our schools um, I've spoken with Megan frequently over the last several weeks and appreciate the partnership that we have with YMCA, appreciate their agility in stepping up so quickly and helping us in a time of need. So thank you very much for all you do and for your staff as well. So again, we thank uh, these businesses in our community 
uh, as well as other partners that we've recognized in the past and future partners that I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to recognize uh, through, again, the Virginia School Boards Association. Thank you, Madam Chair. Next is the King George Education Foundation 2020 Innovation Grant Award. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll uh, introduce uh, Ms. Tammy Inzeth, is here, the president of our King George Education Foundation. Um, and I'll mention uh, that, you know, this, uh, the concept of the Education Foundation started with Tammy Inzeth. Um, we had a conversation in the bleachers of the middle school gym, as I remember it. and. Uh, uh, from there, Ms. Uh, Ms. Inza's spirit and her energy, uh, her dedication has uh, has has uh, pulled together uh, other fine people that I that I see I know are going to join her in presenting these awards. But uh, annually, they they sponsor and they award grant opportunities for our teachers, uh, and this year is no different. So, with that, thank you for being here, and thanks for all you all do. Thank you, Dr. Benson. I'm sorry, I'm trying to. Adjust. Um, good evening, Madam, Ch Madam Chair, uh, board members, Dr. Benson, Ms. Rinko, and community members in person and online. Um, I'm here to present the innovation grants for the King George Education Foundation. Also here tonight with me is Katie Poole, our secretary, and our innovation um, grant committee chair, as well as Chris Buck, our treasurer, and our FoxSmart uh, manager and social media uh, director. Um, and not here tonight, I, I would also like to recognize our other um, board members, um, Pat McDaniel, Pat McDaniel, she's our um, also a Fox Smart manager. Caroline Phelps is our vice president and she's our acting communications director, as well as um, Becky Kreiser is also director. So the mission of the King George Education Foundation is to unite the community to enhance public education. In July, we released our first annual report detailing finances and activities for the previous fiscal year, which spanned July 2019 to June 2020. And if anyone's interested, you can find that on our website, which is kgeducation.org. And there it explains um, uh, the different programs, including the innovation grant program that uh, Fox Smart uh, manages. I'd also like to point out that, um, since I have everyone's <laughs> attention, um, that the uh, Fox Smart has partnered with um, other organizations to include um, King George County uh, Schools, um, Love Thy Neighbor, and um, Oakland Baptist Church to provide virtual school supply bags to, um, to over 200 um, students that uh, may needed supplies um, while they're attending, you know, attending school online at home. So I wanted our community members to know that we, we have lots, we still have lots of supplies and lots of bags um, available. So if you have that need to please work through your school counselor and we can um, get those to you. So on to the innovation grants. Through our innovation grant program, the foundation solicits proposals each year that present a new idea or methodology for achieving the division's curricular goals enhancing students' personal development or encouraging links with the community. This year, we have selected four, we have received and selected all of them, four proposals to receive a grant of up to $500, made possible by donations, in particular, donations made through the school division's employee um, payroll deduction program. So it's your staff and your employees who are donating to, um, to fund these grants for their own, um, you know, their coworkers. So I think that's a great program. So thank you all who have made the donations. So our first recipient is with the preschool. This is the multi-sensory preschool literacy uh, instruction submitted by Jesse Bryant for $491.70. I don't think they're here tonight. Okay. But this grant will go to purchase uh, multi-sensory materials like alphabet sound puzzles, litter formation sand tray, and indented sensory letters, tactical letters with high contrast textures, with letter construction activity and alphabet water cards. These materials will allow the four-year-old students to use multiple um, senses in learning. So thank you, Jesse, for submitting your application. And we look forward to hearing your end of the report to see how the students um, enjoyed and benefited from these um, materials. Our second grant award is to Sealson Elementary School called Let It Go, Let It Grow. And it was a submitted by Amber Dauberly. I believe is her name, for $488.05. Um, this 
For this project, students will participate virtually or in person to be part of the Let It Go, Let It Grow initiative that provides indoor and outdoor green spaces for all Sealston Elementary students and staff. Students will enjoy the sensory aspects of having plants throughout their school environment. Students will help maintain the tower, garden, and indoor aeroponic growing system. Students will also learn the value of gardening and why plants, particularly native plants, are important for all of us. Students will learn to use nature-made gardening practices through composting, a worm farm that students will help to maintain. And they're actually purchasing red wigglers <laughs> as, as part of this program. Uh, this soil will be used for indoor and outdoor plants. Indoor plants will be propagated and donated in an effort to promote indoor green spaces in homes of Sealston uh, SES students and their families. Finally, students and staff will enjoy the improved air quality the indoor plants provide for the entire school. So I'm excited to, uh, to see how that goes. And they're, they're not here as well. Can we okay. All right. So our third grant, and it should be no surprise, <laughs> this goes to King George Elementary School for the learning through play with computational thinking submitted by Yvonne Richards. I believe this is Mrs. Richards' third or fourth, <laughs> fourth uh, grant uh, award. Um, and this is for the purchase of Rubik's Cubes, logic games, and puzzles that will encourage computational thinking through play in the King George Elementary School STEM lab, uh, providing students with the opportunity to develop skills and decomposition, pattern recognition, abstract, and all the algorithms. Even if students remain in 100% virtual environment, it's possible to use these materials virtually by using a supplied document camera. So it's great that these can be used virtually as well as in person. So thank you, Vaughn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Our fourth grant goes to uh, King George High School, the Hamilton Education Program Performance Project submitted by Katrina Wines for $499.90. This is for the, for the purchase of 10 wireless microphone packs to make it possible for every actor to have the same level of audio to capture the temp, I think timbre, how do you say timbre? Timber. And um, timber. timber, okay, <laughs> and quality of sound expected for vocal theatrical performances. <clears throat> the built-in mics that come with computers and webcams on devices we own do nothing to help their voices to be amplified and recorded in a positive way. Although they did a fabulous job during their fall production, <laughs> um, but it took a lot of work. <laughs> so students um, in Mrs. Wine's Theater 2 advanced class will use the new microphones to participate in the Gilder, the Lamaya? Gilder Lerman Institute of American History's Hamilton Education Program online and create their own performance piece, whether it be rap, song, poem, monologue, or scene related to, to a person, event, or key document of the founding era. So if you've seen Hamilton, then you know what I'm talking about. It's a fabulous play. And so we're wait, excited to see what the students uh, are able to use these microphones for their um, performance pieces. So thank you, Katrina. So again, thank you for this opportunity for us to recognize these um, innovation grant recipients. And um, uh, we look forward to providing uh, future updates um, after the first of the year and uh, have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we move on to public and employee comment. No comment tonight. No comment tonight. Is there anybody online? Mr. Vance? Two, thank you. Can you hear me? 
Yes, we can. Okay, there we go. I'm sorry. Um, my name is Christy Law. My daughter is in the second grade at King George Elementary School. In your last meeting, you guys jumped the gun to send the children back again. With all the surrounding schools now having to switch back to full virtual, King George is having like 10, 10 plus positives a day. With switching to this hybrid, our children are actually going to lose out on education. They'll lose their teachers that they've become attached to, the schedules that they've adapted to. I've attended every class with my daughter. I've witnessed children sleeping in class, not having supplies, watching TV, and it's up to the parents to make sure that the children are logging in and participating and using this new way of education to the best of their benefits. Uh, my daughter's teacher had to be absent one day for an appointment that couldn't be rescheduled. And because you guys did not have any substitute teachers that were trained in virtual learning, she wasn't able to have any virtual learning that day, except for the, the small classes. You're acting like these teachers are disposable when you don't have enough teachers to teach virtual and hybrid together, let alone just one. What happens when a student or a teacher tests positive and you have to switch back to virtual when it was safer just to stay virtual to begin with? The repercussions of the actions don't just affect the students and the teachers, it affects brothers, sisters, grandparents, spouses. It's not just in the school alone. And it's pretty obvious that people are not taking this COVID seriously with people getting together in large groups for the holidays and during cold and flu season on top of everything else. And you keep saying essential workers, they have to come to work, but teachers are working. They're just not doing it the way that other people are wanting them to do it. It's up to the parents to make sure that the child does the things that need to be done to utilize the new tools that are available. Maybe offer later classes in the evening to the parents who can't get online during the day. Let the parents be responsible for keeping their children healthy and safe, not the teachers. School's not a daycare. Teachers are not babysitters. As teachers, they are fully capable of teaching virtually. It's up to the parents to utilize it. Schools should stay virtual at least until August. And you shouldn't bring the young ones back first. You should bring juniors and seniors, the ones who will really struggle to make up, not the young ones who can still catch up. Please keep our children virtual until August. With a vaccine coming out, give the teachers a chance to get vaccinated. Make plans to come back for all of the kids at the same time next year. Thank you, Ms. Law, your time is up. Thank you very much. Brian Gregan, 9485 Elm Court, King George, Virginia. I have a first and a fifth grader at King George Elementary School. And I was just calling tonight to thank everyone that's been involved in the in-person planning process and also the board for voting unanimously last week to move forward with the in-person option. Um, I think it's a it's a great thing for the students and, and families of King George. And I just want to encourage everyone on the board and the and the participants planning the process to keep moving forward. And hopefully we'll see an implementation of a return to in-person education January 19th. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to changes to the agenda. Yes, Madam Chair, there, there are just a couple um, clarifications. Um, under discussion items, uh, number 9A, the policy manual updates. Policy, um, it's currently listed as policy JCF. That should say JFC. So we'll make that type of um, adjustment. Just reverse the F and the C under that policy. Also, um, in the consent agenda, we have minutes. Um, the minutes of November, thir November 13th, that special meeting, uh, that also has a typo. The amount in the motion on page two should be 724,000. 
not 742,000. So we just need to reverse the two and the four there. Um, and then lastly, in the uh, November 9th regular meeting minutes on page five, um, it was simply a, for that page. On the bottom of page five, um, it says that, that she said the board needs to listen to the majority, not just the data, that instead of not just, it should be and the data. So strike not just and insert and. But the, those are the um, typing amendments to those minutes for your consent agenda. Uh, outside of that, there are no other changes. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the presentation for the NJRTC update. I'm allowed to take this off? Please. Sure. Thanks, sir. Good evening, um, Major Grant Callahan. I have Sergeant Major Ed Frank with me. I also have a couple seniors, and uh, we'll, we'll get to them um, in, in a few minutes. Um, Madam Chair, school board members, Dr. Benson, community at large listening, uh, good evening, and, and thanks for allowing us to, to come and speak for a few minutes. Uh, what, what I wanted to do tonight is kind of twofold. Well, first off, just um, you know, let you know, almost like a kind of status update. I mean, our, our program continues to, uh, to, to make do and do the best we can with what we have. Um, it's actually pretty neat. If you were to go into our classroom right now, we have... Uh, we're just finishing up, uh, we adopted three families. And those families all have, one has five children and both other have four and then, they, then all of them have um, single parents as well. But um, so my point is, if you go in our classroom right now, you will see just a sea of presents. Uh, we're, we're getting ready to give those out um, <clears throat> later this week, but it's really cool. Uh, it's really awesome. And um, it's, it's just, a, it's a testament to our program and uh, it's a testament to the cadets and the families that we have in our program um, moving, towards, moving towards the common goal of, of becoming better citizens. Which kind of leads me to my next point. Our, our program, um, the, the, purpose, um, the purpose of our program is, is to create better citizens. And uh, you know, we do that through physical fitness. We do that through um, increased um, self-confidence. We do that through leadership opportunities. We do that through um, as much personal engagement and, and seeing, um, you know, seeing what works and what doesn't work. And, uh, it's, uh, it's very different. It's very unique. And, um, and, and we're having a ton of fun doing it. Um, but the, uh, I, I have, a I run in a lot of different circles in the County and, and, and I talk to a lot of different people and, I, whenever I talk about, um, you know, my new job as, as I'm starting my second year here, um, there's always a, there's always conversation that, that links our program to military service after high school, um, which, which is 100% not true, right? Our, our, our program, um, you know, again, we go back to what do we do? We make better, we try to make better citizens. We make better humans as they graduate high school and move out in the real world, whatever that may be. Um, certainly, um, there are there's always a number of um, cadets in our program that do join the military, whether that's enlist or or go the college route with um, commissioned service after, and that's wonderful. But um, what what, uh, what I'm always trying to do and, and and advocate for our program is having conversations with with various people and, and letting them know that. No, there is no connection. We're not a feeder to, to go to boot camp. Uh, we're not a feeder to, to be a, become a commission officer. But but rather, you know, my normal line is if if you're if you're um, if your child or if I'm talking to a talking to a high school age kid is you know if you want to be if you want to be a better person if if you want to increase your physical fitness if you want to to be better strong willed if you want to increase your leadership opportunities if you want to uh, you know, gain self-confidence, all those things that are attributes to, to being a better person, then you may want to consider ROTC. I also tell them 
if if none of those things interest you, then, then please don't consider joining ROTC because because that's what we're here to do. We're here to make you better. Um, which uh, which leads me uh, towards the end. So uh, we have 19 seniors, um, 19 seniors that are cadets graduating this school year. Out of those 19, uh, seven are enlisting, uh, 10 are going to college, and two are, are undecided. Now, one's probably going to do some sort of technical IT stuff, and, and I'm not sure what road that's going to lead him to, and the other one's um, completely undecided. But um, nonetheless, out of those 10, only three are um, most likely pursuing military service after uh, after they get done with college, you know, connected. But um, seven of those 10 um, have, uh, some are going straight into college, some have um, normal scholarships that they've applied for and uh, been recognized for and, um, and other processes or other uh, routes for the college. But nonetheless, uh, my point here in talking about those 19 individuals is we're across the spectrum. Right from going out in the work uh, workforce to going to college to enlisting into the service, as well as um, commissioning programs. But um, so that's that's the composition of our, our 19 seniors that are graduating this year. I brought two um, seniors with me. I'm going to ask them to come up, and um, I I have a third senior who was unable to come, but she did write a short statement. So uh, I just wanted them to come and and briefly talk to you about you know who they are what they're doing next uh, after high school as well as uh, you know what uh, ROTC has done for them I whatever they say I have not looked at so hopefully it's all good good evening everybody thanks for letting me and uh, my fellow cadet come speak so there's actually another cadet which major did mention who was not able to make it tonight so i'm going to start off by reading her little memo that she wrote for you guys um so her name is chloe Perunzik. she's a senior at king george high school and she's planning to go to embry riddle Aero aeronautical university um she plans to pursue a degree in aeronautical science and her statement starts i joined nj rotc as a nervous unsure junior and after being in rotc for three semesters I will graduate with a newfound sense of leadership and confidence. The program has helped me greatly, motivating me to challenge myself and to be the best person I can be. Though it's difficult at times, I've made many opportunities and so many friends and participated in so many new opportunities throughout my time in ROTC that has made it all the worth it. Okay, so that's from Chloe Prunzik. She's also a member um, of NGROTC. So I'll start my short little memo. So my name is Jackson Lusk. I'm a senior at King George High School, and I'm a fourth year ROTC cadet. Um, and my goal upon graduating high school is to uh, commission as an officer into the Navy and attend uh, one of the United States Service Academies. So I'm kind of the contrast of what Major was talking about. I was one of the few that actually does pursue or plan to pursue a career in the United States military. Um, currently, I hold the title of uh, class commander or is essentially a class leader. Um, basically, my job is to, with another one of my fellow cadets of um, NS4, Naval Science 4, the fourth year, um, him and I usually will run a classroom, uh, first to second year ROTC cadets, and we'll kind of mentor them, take them through the steps of what it, what it means to be a good character, of good leadership. Um, we'll kind of guide them through their normal PT sessions, everyday academic learning, and just kind of be, them, be there for them to support them through the class while it is difficult at times. When I first joined the program, the first thing I did um, was we sat down, well, we did the pledge, which was, I wasn't used to that, we don't do that, and we had to stand at attention, and that was an experience all in itself. Um, we said the pledge, we sat down, and uh, Sergeant Major, who was right behind me to my uh, four o'clock, he, he tells everyone to stand up again, and we stand back up. And the first thing he says to us is, uh, no matter what your circumstances, no matter if you are here because your parents told you to be here, you have to sit through this class, right? Um, or if you willingly want to be in this program to better yourself, you're going to get something out of it. And uh, I think that that was that really stuck with me throughout my four years. And I was one of those kids that was willingly there. But there was definitely, I looked to my left and there was someone who I was like, why are they in this program? And ultimately, in the end, they came out a better person. Um, they came out a better leader and a better role model for uh, our community. Um, personally, the NJROTC program at King George High School 
has helped me to develop key leadership skills that I'll use later on in my career as a Naval officer and throughout the rest of my life in general. Um, for the service academies, as you're probably aware, um, they require a great deal of leadership um, opportunities that you have pursued and leadership positions that you've held. Um, they want to see that you're academically and athletically sound. Um, and I think that NJROTC has profoundly helped me the most as compared to other programs that I've been a part of in obtaining some of those leadership opportunities and leadership situations. It really helped me to, like right now, if you asked me, if Major asked me freshman year to come up here and speak in front of you guys, I would be like, uh, what? I don't want to go speak in front of these people. Um, but I have the confidence now. I, I gained the confidence through my leadership. I got used to speaking in front of people and addressing them, and I had to be confident in my decisions. And I think that leading um, and having opportunities to do it in action, like being there in the classroom and actually leading is something that you can't find in a regular classroom. Now, I don't really see ROTC as a class and not really as elective. I see it as a program or a team that I can really be a part of. Um, just recently, we made these shirts. And uh, when I see people wearing the ones from last year, you know, I, it's something that I can relate to. And, uh, you know, I like to say, I'm like, hey, how are you? What class were you in? Were you in NS3, NS4? What class are you? We get to talk about it. We've all been through PT together. We've all been through the drill sessions together. You know, it's just something you can bond over. I think that's really important. Um, one major example is probably the biggest example I have. Every single year we have an annual inspection. Um, and that's when one of the, the higher ups comes down and inspects not only um, major and sergeant major's performance as instructors, but inspects the entire unit in general and gives us a grade. It's uh, pretty intimidating for a lot of cadets and students in general. And so uh, we start about four to six weeks out preparing them for basic drills, basic programs that they'll have to run through and talk through. They have to learn to stand in front of an officer without, you know, buckling their knees and giving out. So uh, it was a lot of work. The first day we did it, uh, me and my fellow cadet started to uh, question. We had them all stand at attention. We played a game of knockout, which is where we walked around the room and we, you know, asked some questions. And I will be honest, it was sorely disappointing <laughs> to see how many actually knew the answers. So, and there were some that just really didn't want to give you answers. Like I would ask them and they'd be like, I don't know, sir. And it would just, you know, it's kind of demoralizing as, as the class leader is you want it, you want them to succeed. You want them to want to be here. Right. So that's something that that taught me was I had to, with my other cadet, we had to lead this class and get them motivated. And it was like basic questions. Like, what is this person's rank? What is, what is this insignia? How many stripes are on the American flag? Um, and we drilled them over and over. And by the end of it, with all the games that we made out of and everything, they were having fun. They enjoyed coming to class every day, even the ones that did not want to be there. I know that they could look forward to it and they were proud of what they'd become. Um, this, is, this opportunity really helped me to uh, um, develop my skills as a leader and to, it just, it's a great example of how someone like myself can come in and, you know, help others and develop myself uh, in those leadership aspects. Um, that's pretty much all I got. Um, I've, last final closing statement for me, I solely believe that any person who comes in, no matter um, <laughs> if they want to be there, they don't want to be there, they'll come out a better student, a better role model, and ultimately a better leader in the end. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my fellow cadet and former cadet CEO, Jillian Yee. Good evening. My name is Jillian Yee. I'm a senior and I'm, as he said, the former commanding officer of the NJRTC unit. Um, I have applied to Virginia Tech for aerospace engineering for next year. And NJRTC, NJRTC not only taught me different military facts and regulations, it more importantly helped me build confidence in myself and taught me very important lessons in leadership and discipline. Um, up until the freshman, my freshman year, I was a homeschool student. I was never really exposed to the public school system. All of my friends were homeschooled and I didn't know what to expect. I was new, I was very shy, very introverted. Um, I, would, I wouldn't have even dreamed that I'd be speaking in front of 
people when my senior year. Um, but then my second semester, I enrolled in NJRTC. I didn't know what it was. My father actually signed me up for it. And, <laughs> and I didn't want to go to the military at all. I thought, I thought like most people that that is something like you go to the military after you do this. But as I went through, as I learned more about it, made new friends, did all the PT, made bonds with people, I found that that's not the case at all. Um, it taught me how to better speak in front of people. It grew my confidence exponentially. Uh, it also taught me how to work well with others um, through being a leader and also as a follower and also as equals. Um, just working, planning events, working with people, our drill team, which is where we do military drill, can be enjoyed by everyone. It is like full of teamwork and all of that. Um, <laughs> it taught me time management and how to plan various events and coordinate with people. Um, it has given, me more volunteer opportunities and team opportunities, such as our um, academic team, uh, PT team or athletic team, our rifle team, academic team. It has grown me physically and mentally and has given me so much confidence and has really shaped me as who I am today through the four years that I've been a cadet. And it's a grateful, great opportunity. I'm not planning on it going anywhere near the military, <laughs> but it has all the lessons that I've learned through NJRTC, I'm going to use no, no matter where I go after high school, no matter what I choose to pursue. And I'm very grateful for that. So that's all I have. And you're adorable. <laughs> That's all we had, uh, barring any questions. So just wanted to come out and, and talk about that stuff. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Merry Christmas, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. We have another presentation. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. Thank you. A CAC. It's right here. Update. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. I see Ms. Bush is here, and Ms. Bush uh, leads up our SEAC committee, our Special Education Advisory Council. Uh, this is a board committee. Uh, she does a fabulous job, not just with the SEAC committee, but uh, we rely on her greatly for her expertise uh, with regard to our students with special needs. So Ms. Bush is here on behalf, though, of the SEAC committee, we wanted to present some information uh, to the board and to our community regarding special education services. So thank you for being here. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I believe we have a presentation. Um, good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Benson, and members of our community, um, those here and online. It's great to be here. I believe there we are. First slide, please. Just wanted to talk to you tonight. Uh, the purpose of tonight's presentation is to talk to you and inform our community about the purpose of our special education advisory committee. Um, we call it SEAC for short. Um, I wanted to share the concerns that the SEAC has discussed um, under COVID and through their request, the presentation to the board this evening. Also, just to make you and the public aware regarding resources and steps uh, that families can take should they have concerns regarding their child's IEP or delivery of services during this time. And then lastly, I'll conclude with just um, reviewing other good to know information including how our students with disabilities are currently being served in our school division. Next slide, please. So the purpose of our SEAC is to assist in developing and prioritizing strategies to meet the needs of our students with disabilities. So we've had some discussion on that in our last meeting about a week ago. We also make recommendations to the superintendent regarding education of our children with disabilities. And we assist the division in interpreting plans that we have to the community 
for meeting those needs for our children. And so that's part of why I'm here this evening, because I want to raise some general awareness uh, for our families. Um, SEAC met last week, and as I said, um, requested that I would come before you to give an update regarding these services that are being provided to our children with IEPs or independent educational programs or plans, I'm sorry. Next slide, please. So in order for us to kind of dive into this, I want to first talk to you about FAPE or free and appropriate education and our continuum of services that's pre, that was pre-COVID-19. Um, so there on the screen, you'll see the triangle. Um, at the very top of the triangle is where most of our children with disabilities are served. It's the least restrictive environment for our children. Um, part of IDEA says that we are to educate our children with disabilities in the least restrictive environment um, that we can for them to receive that free and appropriate education based on their disability. Um, so general education is the default. Um, and we add specialized assistance in there or any supplementary services or aids or accommodations in the classroom for our children. Um, and if that is not working, IEP teams convene and they look at what other services might be needed for that child. Um, and then they move down to maybe a more restrictive environment um, if those um, strategies or accommodations or services are not working for the child. Um, for a more restrictive environment, some of our students were served in uh, full-time special education classes. That's classrooms taught by certified special education teachers with all students with disabilities um, in the classroom. And if that um, environment was not working for the student and they required a deeper or more restrictive environment, then some of our children are in separate, school, separate uh, private day schools for students just with special needs. Um, and then the most restrictive environment is our students who might be homebound or home-based receiving services um, or students that are in the hospital receiving instruction. So that's what it looked like pre-COVID-19. Um, so since March 13th, that continuum, as you can imagine, has certainly taken a slightly different shape, um, but the process still remains the same for moving students between those more restrictive and least restrictive environments, and that is to hold an IEP team meeting. Next slide, please. So this now is how the continuum um, currently looks in our division. So to the left there, you'll see um, what it looked like pre-COVID-19, and now you'll see what it looks like here. So we still have most of our special education students that are being served in the general education setting. But what does that mean? What does that look like in our um, landscape today? Well, it looks like the synchronous and asynchronous like our general education students are receiving. It also um, looks like some of our students receiving those special education services with, um, in their special education classrooms. Um, or self-contained classrooms virtually and asynchronously. So those IEPs have been adjusted to reflect that. And actually, um, our case managers this year have done a great job of meeting with all 628 um, families to go through and amend all those IEPs since August um, to write those IEPs in a flexible way so that um, based on whatever decision the local school board makes for whether the students come in to school or whether they're out completely virtually or whether they're hybrid, that their services would be accounted for in the IEP. And so right now, out of this approximately 628 students that we serve pre-K to 12 um, that have disabilities, about 598 of those students are being served in King George um, through those first few settings. So through the virtual, um, synchronous and asynchronous, and then um, we have about 50 students there that are being served full-time in special ed class, face-to-face -face or packets only. So what that means is there are some students with disabilities that were unable to receive um, a free and appropriate education or their services virtually based on um, the significance of their disability. 
And so some of those students are being served face-to-face -face and have been since July, August timeframe. Um, and then we have some whose families um, have been concerned with that face-to-face -face piece, even though we've provided all the PPE, and we certainly understand that. And so those students are being served asynchronously through packets and parents and case managers checking in based on the services that are written in the IEP. So we're still able to serve our students. Um, and then we have about 30 students who currently are outplaced um, either private day or residential, so they're going down the road for services. Um, and of those students, we have approximately 18 that are being bused um, every week for their private day services. And then we have less than 10 students who are um, homebound or hospital receiving their services there. So that's currently what it looks like um, for, our, um, for our students with disabilities. And so next slide, please. I wanted to also um, let you and everyone else know that we have um, protective PPE equipment has been provided since students with disabilities have been back in the building since July. In July, we began um, evaluating for, for um, or continued evaluating our students um, that we were initially referring for special education services, but also since we've had students being served face to face um, and that number has grown a little bit. Um, we have provided the PPE for approximately um, 83 staff members across all five schools and the early childhood. Um, and you know, my kudos to Mary Fisher and her staff, the lead nurse, Jackie uh, Kunzman, and the nurses at each of those buildings who have um, done a great job really training all of the staff and also outfitting the staff and making sure um, that they have provisions for the next few weeks, letting me know when they need that um, and making sure that as um, new staff members need to be trained or need those PPE pieces that they are being provided for them. All right. Also, I um, wanted to share with you some success stories that I've heard from some of our teachers. Um, I think the overall theme from them has been that um, how happy they are to be able to um, partner with parents and that working relationship has built stronger during this time. Um, and I know staff has been very appreciative um, of that and that partnership. And um, I wanted to also share with you the other services that are going on behind the scenes that you really don't hear about is the telehealth that is still being provided by our related uh, service providers, such as counseling, speech, occupational therapy, and vision services. Um, in order for our speech and counseling to be in place, um, our providers have worked really hard to get an additional um, consent form from the families to be able to provide that telehealth. Um, so they are meeting uh, with their students still. I will also say that there are some families um, that they have not been able to get in touch with. So um, if you're one of those families listening in tonight um, or afterwards and your child is supposed to be receiving those services and is not, please contact your provider because they are um, ready and uh, willing to do those telehealth services um, for the child as prescribed for the IEP, it's just a matter of um, setting that up. I also wanted to um, let you know that we have our postgraduate program that's here at the high school. We have students who are postgraduate, which means they have fulfilled all the requirements for their special um, IEP diploma. And they usually come back to us for um, some on-the-job training, interview prepping, and resume building. And so while we have not been able to do that in person, face-to-face, -face, we have been able to do that. We have just under eight students who are doing virtual job shadowing through a program through Virginia Department of Education. And that's been very successful. And they're working with our job coach also for interview preparation and also uh, resume writing. So that's something that we've been able to continue on and we're very proud of. Um, we also have continued to provide virtual staff trainings. Um, as we started in August and we didn't have students quite yet, a lot of our support staff went through and either did uh, the VCU autism certificate. Um, we've also encouraged some of our other support staff to look at the registered behavior technician 
um, programming which works with students with disabilities for uh, behavior and uh, applied uh, behavior analysis um, in working with ABAs um, to get that training in place so that uh, we can further their education and also get additional credentials for um, our staff members as students do come back in the building. Um, and then also crisis intervention. Um, this goes along hand in hand with uh, the restraint and seclusion policy that actually will be before you this evening. Um, we've been able to do the classroom uh, version online with our staff and the hands-on, we've been able to do very modified hands-on training uh, with our staff to make sure that all of our staff who is working face-to-face -face with students um, are do have the uh, proper training that they need to have in place. So those are just some of the things that we've been able to continue to do. Next slide, please. And this is our last slide. I wanted to lastly talk to you about resources for our families. Um, there may be instances where, um, where parents and students with disabilities um, are struggling and they may feel like they do not have support or um, have concerns. So we always want to remember that our first line of defense is really to contact that case manager or that teacher that is working with the student. Um, I will say that all of our teachers and staff are working really hard and being very creative during this time um, to meet all of the needs of our students with disabilities. Uh, but sometimes there are little things that go on behind the scene and behind the screen um, that the parents may see that the teachers don't. And so we ask for that communication to continue between the parents and the student, uh, between the parents and the teachers. Um, and if it's not rectified from there, then the next um, step would be to call the administrators, talking with the administrators. Um, our administrators have been very good about meeting with the IEP team to troubleshoot shoot concerns with the family or the children um, and then coming up with creative ways to support those uh, students. In some instances, I'll share that the IEP teams um, have also looked at adjusting some of the synchronous and asynchronous times for students to be more successful. Um, and then some of the students have come into the internet cafes as well. So we have had um, some pretty creative ways to uh, work with our students and our families. And I just wanted people to know that those are the routes that uh, they could you know, go and who to contact if they are having concerns. An additional resource, I'm an additional resource here in the community. Um, and so if anyone would like to contact me, again, Ann Bush, Supervisor of Special Services, um, you can always call me and I'm happy to link, with, link any of our parents um, with the right people that they need to talk to um, regarding what the concerns are for their child. Um, the Special Ed Advisory Committee is also a good resource um, that we're really trying to get out there. And I feel like pre-COVID, we were doing a really great job of getting families out um, and contacting with them and getting them supports and resources needed. Um, and so our next meeting is January 5th. I know we, um, we have a Facebook page, but we also try to push it out through multiple um, avenues here in the community and um, online. And so... Um, we're all here to support our families and our children with disabilities. And I just wanted to thank you all for your support um, as we continue to do so. And that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to hear any questions you have. Great, are there any questions? Thanks. Great right. presentation. Thank you very much, Ms. Bush. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Yes, Bush. thank you. Okay. Now we're ready to move on to the consent agenda. Do I have a motion to accept the consent agenda? I move that we accept the consent agenda of the of, uh, let me start again. Accept, I move that we accept the consent agenda with the typing amendments, the minutes of August 24, October 5, October 26, November 2nd, November 9, November 13, and November 16, 2020 as presented. Second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. aye. Chair votes aye. The minutes for August 24th, October 5th, October 26th, November 2nd, November 9th, November 13th, and November 16th have been approved.
Moving on to the discussion items, we have the policy manual updates. Madam Chair, members of the board, and just to let the community know, um, each, uh, well, quarterly or, or throughout the year, we receive uh, suggested or provided amendments from the Virginia School Board Association to which this board and other boards in Virginia subscribe uh, for policy assistance. So the VSBA helps to keep our policy manual in line with any statutory changes uh, in Virginia or any regulatory changes that we need to be sensitive to. So these recommended adjustments come to you by way of VSBA. Um, I know that you all know that up here, but I just want to make sure our community understands that's how we uh, we keep our policies tightly coupled with current statutory requirements. Did anybody have any questions or comments? Mr. Collins? Okay. Okay, we will move on to the information items. We have any committee reports? We had the C health advisory. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, the health advisory committee revision. Mr. Benson, did you have anything to say about that? Was that supposed to be part of the? Was it in the packet? Was it in the packet? Substituting one, substituted one nurse for another nurse. nurse. I think somebody left and somebody came. Oh, I don't, I don't have a note on that, so I, forgive me. Um, it's, wait, let me see if is I it in your, in your packet? Yeah. Yes. yes. It's in the packet. It was a staff replacement of one nurse for another nurse. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I was told that. Johnson. That's right. We had a member for the health advisory committee is one of the board's committee. And we had a committee member um, who was needing to be replaced. And I believe there's a recommendation there for you. So we simply wanted to um, to add that to committee member to keep that committee it's complete item for, for the uh, member who who needed to leave that committee. So okay. substitute, in other words. Thank you for reminding me. Okay, moving on. Do we have any committee reports? I do. You I do. Um, I have two actually. Um, one is SEAC, which Ms. Bush just did an excellent job recapping. All that was discussed at our meeting, and thank you, Ms. Bush, for doing that in such a timely manner. We just met last week, and she put that presentation together. So, nothing further to add, but I appreciate your hard work. Um, I also attended the Health and Safety Advisory Committee meeting, and forgive me for being on my phone where that's where the minutes are because I didn't really make any notes. It was really a recap since um, kind of ending in March. Um, the only thing of note that I'd like to report is that the CDC recently provided an option to reduce the quarantine time for exposure to COVID from 14 days to 10, but the PD-16 um, nurses group that meets regularly has decided to um, stick with the 14-day quarantine. Um, that was only probably the most important thing of, like I said, of note to discuss. There was just really updates about um, COVID in numbers and kind of just re recapping where we ended in March of last year. So that's all I have. Thank you. Anybody else? So I did um, listen into the CTE committee. I don't think anybody really knew I was there. Um, when Ms. Hill asked for people, I couldn't get my phone unmuted quick enough because I was just listening in through the phone. But um, it's amazing the things that the kids are able to do uh, going through um, this pandemic. And um, I know that one of um, the presenters had presented uh, some information on how many students actually um, go into the career field right after uh, high school. Um, and I had that all on my laptop, but I don't have a way to plug it in and it was dead. So, but um, I believe Ms. Hill was going to make some of that um, information available on our website. It's quite interesting. Um, we're doing a great job. I'm really, really excited about it. I guess we'll move on to the superintendent's report. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just have one um, uh, one announcement really to make, and that is we uh, the staff has been um, very responsive, and we've been working hard to uh, to craft um, a we're calling it a kind of a re-registration, where we need to confirm with our families the board has um, approved a return January 19th as a target. Uh, to in-person learning and to do so and to plan accordingly, uh, we do need to reconfirm and I apologize that we're reconfirming um, 
in, in succession for a couple of our stakeholder groups. Um, but in some instances, particularly at the secondary level, we've not had an opportunity to reconfirm or re-register uh, choices of families in terms of either remaining virtual or engaging in in-person learning. So we do have prepared and ready to go tomorrow morning, but I wanted to um, announce it this evening uh, to you all uh, as our school board that uh, we are ready to deploy tomorrow morning a communication to families and to give families uh, the holiday break and until January, the end of the day, January 5th, I believe it is, um, an opportunity to, um, to consider uh, the decision. Um, so that uh, information will be going out tomorrow morning, um, unless you otherwise uh, guide me, so that we again can re-register the preference of our families and students in terms of uh, remaining virtual or moving to an in-person modality for learning. There is information uh, attached to the um, uh, the survey. Uh, there will be a link to information on the website that summarizes um, much, uh, if not all, of the information you heard the other uh, last meeting uh, for our families. And of course, we're happy to answer questions um, as those questions come up, uh, either through email or we wanted to wait until after the the holiday break and give a couple days uh, when we're back in this in school session for families to contact either the schools or uh, central support folks for any clarification they need prior to registering uh, their decision. So uh, look for that, that'll be going out and I just wanted to make that public tonight. Um, and I appreciate your opp the opportunity to do so. Thank you, Mr. Benson. Okay, we'll move on to board comment. Ms. Gonzalez. All right, thank you, I was good first. Um, so I would like to say congratulations to all of the VSBA Honor Roll um, and Innovation Grant recipients. That was a lot of really good news this evening. Um, thank you, I know folks have left, but thank you to Major Callahan and Cadet Slusk and Yee, hopefully I got their names right for speaking tonight. I know it was very informative to me, so I appreciated that um, that update. I'd also like to thank Ms. Bush for the SEAC overview and update. It was also a lot of very good information because I know we have there have been a lot of questions from families on special ed services, so thank you. I think that was great information. Um, um, I guess moving on to other topics, I would like um, to see if we could get an update um, at some point on the YMCA childcare situation for what the what the future holds for that when the current funding is expended. Um, I also would like to request that a dashboard be posted on our homepage with up-to-date case numbers per buildings or as we see fit. Um, I know other divisions have certainly done that and I think that is um, good to provide transparency to community and family members. I also know I mentioned it last week, but I would again request that we revisit local health metrics, um, specifically the use of the CDC core indicators as reopening criteria to aid in any future decision making. Um, I know this is our last meeting before the holidays, but um, I think there is still time to to firm that up and have a conversation about that in January when we return. And then lastly, um, this is a question that came up. I thought it was a great one. Now that a vaccine, the first vaccine has been approved by the FDA, I was wondering if we could seek guidance from BDH um, or similar on when and how a vaccine will be made available to teachers. I don't know if there are like going to be local options or that sort of thing, but that might be some good information to have um, whenever it becomes available. And that is all I had. Um, I guess otherwise, just want to thank staff and bus drivers and all of our um, Dr. Benson and staff and everyone that has been involved with um, continuing our services and wonderful education for our students throughout this very trying semester um, through the COVID pandemic. I know um, it's been a lot of work. It's not lost on me. So thank you to everyone that has helped made that possible. And I hope everyone enjoys the holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Tolliver? Yeah, I'm going to... Um... I mumble on a good day, so I'm going to take my mask off for a second. I concur with Ms. Gonzalez about a dashboard on our website and also about um, using some kind of metric speed at the core indicators would probably be the best idea for either not just reopening, but also for returning to virtual if that were to come to pass. Um, on a happier note, I'd like to encourage everyone to join the King George High School Theater Department December 18th and 19th for their virtual performance of A Christmas Carol. They did an excellent job in the fall with their virtual performance, so you can buy tickets. I believe it's on Eventbrite, but I know they have a Facebook page, and I'm sure they would love. It's kind of, it's not the same to be in person, but it's kind of fun to stand in your kitchen and watch it on TV and enjoy the kids and what an excellent job they do and what an excellent job Miss Wines does. And congratulations to her and the other King George Education Foundation grant recipients this evening. 
Also, just in closing out the year, I want to thank all the staff for working tirelessly. I, I know personally that many, many staff are in their offices and in their buildings until eight and nine o'clock at night some days, and they've really done a lot to continue to support each other, to support our students, and to support our community. So I wish everybody a relaxing and peaceful and safe holiday break, and thank you for all you've done. This semester has been really tough, so we do appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tolliver. Oh, uh, Ms. Hawk? Thank you. Um, I'll try to be heard this time. I, I want to say uh, thank you, first of all, to our uh, BSBA recipients, Campbell's Vending, LifePoint Church, and of course, the, the YMCA locally in King George. Uh, it, it is wonderful to be supported so actively by our, our local staff and by the, the people who work in and around and for King George. Uh, and I want to say a special thank you to our seniors uh, from NJROTC representing all 19. I had no idea there were 19 seniors. Um, I, I hope we, we have enough freshmen to, to fill in the, the, the spaces next year, and I'm, I trust we will. I want to say especially thank you to both of them for speaking so clearly about um, how they gained from NJROTC, uh, not just in a, in a military strength or information, but in terms of, of self-confidence and, um, and, and community interactions and, and so many positives. Um, I, I think we have been very fortunate in the staffing we've had over the years at NJROTC and and I trust that they will continue to support us that effectively. Um, I wanted to clarify uh, a comment that I had made uh, in social media, and I wanted to thank uh, Dr. Boyd and Ms. Collins and Ms. Harris for the for the really um, intricate, uh, detailed. Um, information they gave about the proposed schedules for next year, uh, for, for next semester, my apologies, um, beginning January 19th, we hope. Um, I certainly support the um, need for uh, clear metrics for our staff and our families to look at uh, when we can feel um, safer about our, our students and our staff returning. I know there are so many feelings out there. We, uh, we have a, a very um, difficult year behind us. And I think with the, the administration of the vaccines beginning today, we, we have hope, a hopeful year ahead of us. But these things are the most important thing we can do, this in social distancing, to help all children get back in school and stay in school, uh, because that's the continuity that we want. Um, I want to say thank you to my fellow board members. Um, Ms. Pensieri, you, you've led us through a very difficult year. Um, and I, I'm, again, uh, thinking that, uh, Difficult times bring strength and learning. Uh, we gain from the most difficult situations. And uh, Dr. Benson, thank you from the bottom of my heart for, for all the time and effort you've put in and your staff. Uh, it, of, all, of all roles in your staff, uh, it, it has been an amazing thing to see the the division of King George County Schools come together and operate very effectively, given what's happening in King George County and the world. So, so thank you to everyone. And also a, a happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, and, and happy Kwanzaa to everyone and, and have a, a peaceful celebration. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hawk. Mr. Collins? I'd like to thank Ms. Instead and the Educational Foundation that, that you um, 
Uh, I remember when you started, you did a great job and you continue to with the rest of the folks that have been in there since the beginning and keep awarding those grants to their, their folks. The NJRTC um, is, a, is a terrific program. I've highly supported that program the entire time I've been here. Um, uh, so we, Sergeant Major is um, retiring. That's, that's sad and he's happy for his new start in retirement, but he's been an integral part of that program. Um, I'd like to congratulate our honor roll recipients um, for doing an outstanding job helping our students and the SEAC committee. Thank you, Ms. Bush. Um, I would suggest to the Madam Chair that maybe schedule an organizational meeting for the first of the year. I don't think it's on the on the list for um, the first week of January. And I wish everyone a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And thanks for everybody what they do. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Um, so I, I just would like to really thank our staff um, and Dr. Benson. Um, I think they've done a, a bang up job trying to get us through this <clears throat> pandemic. And even though there's been a lot of division, I, I think that we're a community strong and we're going to be able to come together here in the end. Um, and even though, um, you know, there is that division, I think that we all stand firm that uh, we just want what what is best for um, not only our kids, but for our community. So our hearts are in it all the way down, um, deep down. And, uh, you know, I appreciate everybody for their comments, um, whether or not I agree with them or not, I still do appreciate, uh, appreciate them. Um, I'd also like to um, thank uh, just the entire CTE uh, program that we have, uh, NJRTC, um, DECA, um, are, are two that always stand out, obviously, because the NJRTC was here, but they really form leaders in our community. And um, I think that's just an, an exceptional way that they transform some of our students and give them the confidence, as we saw in here tonight. Um, and I, I just think the whole CTE program is an amazing program. I've always been a big supporter of that. Um, so, uh, Mr. Collins, I guess uh, we do need to uh, have that organizational meeting on January 4th, I believe is the first um, first meeting. So we need to do a vote for that. We'll just I don't really it. recall. We'll we just set it up January 4th. Just set it up. Just have it recorded for January 4th for the organizational meeting. Okay. All right, so um, I guess we need to go ahead and move into uh, closed meeting. Do you have somebody that would like to listen to closed meeting? Pursuant to state code section 2.2-3711.A.1 for the purpose of consideration of prospective candidates for employment and assignment of substitutes, resignation, and stipends of employees of the school board. I move that we go into closed session. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Chair votes aye. We are now into closed session.
for an open session. I move that King George County School Board return to open session and certify that pursuant to state code 2.2-3712.D, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements under this chapter and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened were heard, discussed, or considered in the meeting by the public body. Second and certify. Second and certify. 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 Do I have a motion to approve? Make a motion to approve personnel as presented. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Chair votes aye. aye. Motion, motion approved. Make a Do motion to adjourn. Yes. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Chair votes aye. We are now adjourned.